go into the world. And tell every man that you meet, there is a man on the cross. A Catholic take. What do you need to know right now? A bold synthesis of inspiration and information. Keeping you up to date on the news and issues from a courageous Catholic perspective. A Catholic Take with Joe McLean starts now. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean. So good to be on with you. Praise be to God in this Monday of Holy Week. We have survived it. Can you believe we've already made it to Holy Week? Lent is almost over. I wonder how you did. How, mm, we should talk about that at some point this week. How did you do? Did you uh, did you hold fast to all of your penitential practices that you set out just a few weeks back to do? I wonder. We're going to have to have that conversation at some point this week. But on the program today, we need to talk about the Trump indictment. Are we seeing history in the making here? We've invited a Catholic and an attorney, Brent Haynes, to be on the program to break it down for us. What can we expect to see this week and what does it all mean from a Catholic perspective? Brent Haynes joins us at 15 past the hour to talk about the Trump indictment. At 30 past the hour, a sore subject, both physically and spiritually. We're talking about vas- vasectomy reversals. I mean, how many Catholic men have had vasectomies? Well, we're going to have a conversation about why they should get them or should consider reversing them. We've invited a gentleman on who had a great conversation with his wife on YouTube about why he got one to begin with and why he also had it reversed as well. So that's coming up at 30 past the hour. Do join us if you can. Lots of stories in the news, of course, and we're going to cover as much of it as we possibly can. All of the links you can find to all the uh, articles we discuss in the news, all the conversations with our guests and so much more will be found in our show notes. Go to the station of the cross.com forward slash ACT to get on the uh, email list, but also you can find the show notes linked up right there. That's the station of the cross.com forward slash ACT. Let's pray. Let's begin. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known. That anyone who fled to thy protection, implored thy help, or sought thine intercession was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, I fly unto thee, O virgin of virgins, my mother. To thee do I come, before thee I stand, sinful and sorrowful. O mother of the word incarnate, despise not my petitions, but in thy mercy hear and answer me. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, and now your saint of the day. Blessed Francisco Solis Pedrajas, pray for us. Francisco was born to a poor and pious family on July 9th, 1877. He was ordained a priest in the year 1900, and in all his assignments, he was known for his wisdom, his zeal, and his piety. He was made archpriest in the city of Macha in Real, 1914. Surrounded by increasing anti-clerical sentiment in Spain, he founded a Catholic Union and men's and women's branches of Catholic action, striving to implement Catholic social teaching in the spirit of Pope Leo XIII's encyclical Rerum Novarum. When the communists came to power in Spain in 1936, Francisco was eventually arrested along with many of his parishioners and fellow priests Throughout this persecution, he ministered to his fellow prisoners physically and spiritually. In the early hours of April the 3rd, 1937, Francisco and several other prisoners were taken to the parish cemetery in Macho Real, where they would be executed. The soldiers, however, were reluctant to kill a priest, and Francisco gave absolution and encouragement to the prisoners until he was the only one left alive. Finally, one soldier shot him, and his body was dumped into a mass grave along with the other companions. His only crime under the communist regime was being a priest. He was beatified on October the 27th, 2013 by Pope Francis. Blessed Francisco Solis Pedrajas, pray for us. And now your headline news. Reuters reports Saudi Arabia announces surprise cuts in oil production. 
Saudi Arabia and other OPEC oil producers on Sunday announced further oil output cuts of around 1.16 million barrels per day in a surprise move that analysts said would cause an immediate rise in prices and the United States called inadvisable. The pledges bring the total volume of cuts by OPEC, which groups the organizations of the petroleum exporting countries with Russia and other allies, to 3.66 million barrels per day, according to Reuters calculations, equal to 3.7% of global demand. The latest reductions could lift oil prices by $10 per barrel, while oil broker PVM said it expected an immediate jump once trading starts after the weekend. Get ready for higher gas prices at the pump. Trending Politics reports Bud Light Goes Woke prints image of trans influencer on special cans. An image of Dylan Mulvaney, a transgender TikTok influencer, was printed on special Bud Light cans to celebrate Mulvaney's transgenderism. Mulvaney announced he was a paid influencer for Bud Light in an Instagram post on Saturday. Quote, This month I celebrated my day 365 of womanhood and Bud Light sent me possibly the best gift ever, a can with my face on it, close quote. Social media uh, users rightly criticized the adv- advertisement. However, I think it was Babylon B who said it best, quote, a beverage pretending to be a beer featuring a man pretending to be a woman, close quote. CNBC reports 32 dead as tornadoes wreak havoc from Arkansas to Delaware. The storms tore a path through the Arkansas capital and also collapsed the roof of a packed concert venue in Illinois, stunning people throughout the region with the scope of the damage. Biden earlier declared broad areas of the country major disaster areas, making federal sources and financial aid available for recovery. Governor Sarah Huckabee Sanders in Arkansas, where at least five people were killed, already had declared a state of emergency and activated the National Guard. Confirmed or suspected tornadoes in 11 states destroyed homes and businesses, splintered trees, and laid waste to neighborhoods. It may take days to confirm all the recent tornadoes. The dead included at least nine in one Tennessee county, five in Indiana, and four in Illinois. Let's keep their souls in our prayers today and this week. And those are your headline news. Thanks be to God. And your gospel today comes to us from John chapter 12, verses 1 through 11. Six days before Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. They gave a dinner for him there, and Martha served while Lazarus was one of those reclining at table with him. Mary took a liter of costly perfumed oil and made from genuine aromatic nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and dried them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. Then Judas the Iscariot, one of his disciples, and the one who would betray him said, Why was this oil not sold for 300 days' wages and given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief and held the money bag and used to steal the contributions. So Jesus said, Leave her alone. Let her keep this for the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. The large crowd of the Jews found out that he was there and came not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. And the chief priests plotted to kill Lazarus too, because many of the Jews were turning away and believing in Jesus because of him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Cornelius Alapide, gold standard in biblical commentary, in my opinion, says symbolically, God made all things in six days. On the sixth, he made man. In the sixth age of the world, he willed to redeem him. He suffered on the sixth day of the week and died at the sixth hour. Mystically, St. Augustine says the ointment was righteous. It was righteousness. Therefore, it was of due weight. 
Coloss says, The pound of ointment is the perfection of righteousness. Morally, here, learn that the good works with which we anoint Christ ought to be quite free from fault and of the very best kind. Lastly, the raising of Lazarus was especially the work of God, and they therefore who were so eager to put him to death were fighting against God and challenging him, as it were, to the contest. Close quote. One thing I like about what Cornelius said in here was the intentional aspect of how we give back to God. Like the fact that it was so much was a sign of our heart's intention, our heart's desire. The, the effort we go through to be very intentional in giving right and due worship, adoration to God signifies our intent. So we can't go far enough. We can't do enough. It's true. Nothing we can do, right? I mean, like we're so limited as creatures, but we can sure try. Right? Amen. You know, well, God knows, God knows I I have a good heart and yeah, sure. But God also knows you've got better clothes in the closet that you can put on every Sunday, right? Not for your neighbor, not so what they can see, but what God can see in your heart and your desire to do the best possible job you could ever do. He knows how limited you are. He knows what you're capable of. And he knows what your thoughts and your hearts are. So let's give to God what is right and do to him our absolute best. Our absolute best. All right, coming up after the break, attorney Brent Haynes is going to break down the Trump indictment. What does this all mean? Did this just re-energize Trump's campaign? We're about to find out. Don't go anywhere. Be right back. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean. So good to be on with you. Praise be to God. Coming up at 30 past the hour, we're going to have a conversation about vasectomies. Ryan Joseph is going to be joining us. I saw a video recently of him talking to his wife about why he got the vasectomy to begin with and why he has chosen to have it reversed. It's a powerful conversation, and I know that you know, and I know, that there are a lot of Catholic men who are in this category. And who knows, this may impact them as well. So how about you invite some of them to tune in at 30 past the hour and join us for that conversation. But joining us right now by telephone is our good friend, attorney Brent Haynes, Catholic freedom fighter. Good morning to you, Brent. Good morning, Joe. Praise be to God. Hope you're feeling better. You've been under the weather lately. Yeah, well, it comes and goes, you know, it's just a normal course of life, isn't it? No, the normal course of life. Well, maybe nowadays, who knows? Because it seems like the normal course of life includes a former president being indicted on criminal charges, possibly being handcuffed, possibly getting the perp walk, possibly getting the mugshot. Who knows? What's the story here? Are we making history with this? We are making history, Joe. Uh, history has already been made because we know that uh, a former president and a current declared candidate for president who is the, according to the polls, the leading candidate for president for one of the two major parties has been indicted. This has never happened in American history. Now, we don't know what the indictment is yet because it has not been unsealed, but we know that he has been indicted. So that is history. And as to your comment about it becoming uh, part of the usual course of history, um, that uh, appears to be true. It appears that um, we have the increasing politicization of the legal system. Um, we have the increasing use of the, uh, not just say the FBI um, or other uh, government agencies, the Department of Justice uh, being used for political purposes to advance political policies beyond you know, the normal scope of governmental political policies, you know, such as going after parents at school board meetings, we now have law enforcement and the criminal justice system being used by people who control one political party to go after someone that they oppose in the opposing political party. So we are on the road to becoming a form of a third world government if this continues. So it becomes a problem when this becomes normalized. You know, I find it very fascinating that even Democrats feel like this is a biased issue. A, a, many, a mansion came out, I think it was over the weekend, who was saying this is a very biased thing. So we're seeing people on both sides of the aisle say, you know, 
it doesn't seem right. It seems like Obama got a pass on campaign uh, financial violations. Hillary Clinton quietly settled the steel dossier deal, never got arrested, didn't make the headlines until after it was all said and done. And yet it's Donald Trump who's been indicted. It's Donald Trump who's going to have to appear in court in Manhattan on Tuesday, which is tomorrow. So are we seeing a, a very biased situation unfold before our eyes? Well, Joe, the more examples we have, uh, the harder it is to avoid the conclusion that it is a biased situation. You know, documents are found and uh, for, in the Trump uh, residence or in tr- on Trump's private property after he leaves the White House. Uh, it becomes a federal raid and a potential criminal case. Uh, then documents are found at the former, at, at pres- current President Joe Biden, uh, his uh, former place of business before he became president, after he was vice president, and his home, and yet there are no raids, everything is worked out, and there's no talk of, a, no talk of any kind of criminal investigation. And Vice President Biden didn't even have the, the ability, as President Trump did, to declassify material before he left office. Uh, Hillary Clinton, of course, destroyed uh, information on her, famously destroyed, notoriously destroyed information on her computer. Uh, and then was just sarcastic about it. She just rubbed it in everyone else's faces when she was asked at the press conference. Remember, um, when when asked if she had, um, you know, cleaned it or used bleach or something, you know, she made that sarcastic gesture at the press conference. What do you mean? Did I like clean it, you know, with bleach or something to that effect? I mean, she was just completely sarcastic about it. And for good reason, because she knew nothing was going to happen to her. And FBI Director James Comey, remember, he came out and said he had made the decision that no reasonable prosecutor could prosecute her. Well, you know, Joe, I'm a prosecutor, and I'd be very reluctant to prosecute any political figure uh, for a crime unless it's very serious because you don't want the criminal justice system to intrude into politics unless a serious crime has been committed. There's very good reason to believe that. But that wasn't Jim Comey's call. But he made a call. That didn't even go to the depart- to the higher-ups in the Department of Justice. Most importantly, it didn't go to the lawyers. The best example um, is the Steele dossier. Um, mm. Hillary Clinton and the Democratic National Committee paid over $100,000. And that, that's, the news of that settlement came out almost exactly a year ago. Um, so it's, you know, it's ironic in terms of, in terms of the timing. Um, but, but that was reported by the Associated Press a year ago on March 31st. Um, so if there was a campaign finance violation, you know, these are usually settled uh, civilly. And in this case with Trump, um, it's important to know that the U.S. Attorney's Office has already refused to bring this case. The previous district attorney in Manhattan, Cyrus Vance, who was a legend in New York law enforcement, he refused to bring this case. Alvin Bragg ran for DA, and one of his campaign promises was that he would go after Trump. So a politician runs for uh, office to be a prosecutor. He says, I am going to go after this particular person. He gets in that office. He goes after that person, even when other prosecutors have refused to do so. And he's already made his own political campaign prompts to do that. Does that not look like selective prosecution? Yeah. Yeah, it sure does. So I think a lot of people are wondering, are they going to see a mugshot of Donald Trump? Do you think the Secret Service will allow Donald Trump to be put into a holding cell? Will they allow him to be handcuffed? Um, Are we going to see a perp walk? No, that, that is unlikely. Now, there will be a mugshot. Uh, there, certainly, there will be a mugshot because that's the normal part of the process. Uh, but of course, uh, Donald Trump has Donald Trump's picture is everywhere anyway. So that doesn't matter as much in terms of it actually being a mugshot. It's just the historical aspect of it that matters. Um, about 20, 20 years ago or so, people uh, probably forgotten this, but the uh, majority leader of the House was a congressman from Texas named Tom DeLay. And a rogue district attorney in Travis County, Texas, went before not one, not two, but three grand juries in order to find a grand jury that would charge Tom DeLay with a crime. And guess what that crime was, Joe? Um, Campaign well, finance violations. Okay. <laughs> and Tom DeLay, when he went in, he was smarter. He got some good advice. But he was just a smart politician. After all, he was the uh, 
the majority leader in the House, so the second most important congressman in the country. When he went in for his mugshot, he wore a very nice suit, and he just smiled like it was a campaign photo. And if you didn't know it was a mugshot, you would have thought it was a campaign photo. I wouldn't be surprised if well, President Trump doesn't do the same thing. Okay, so I think that brings up the next question, because there are some who are saying, you know, up until this point, he was losing steam. His base was just not as energized. You know, his rallies aren't as big and epic and just, you know, the, the, the MAGA nation, if you will, was about to lose steam. And now this may re-energize all of that. This could work in his favor, much to the chagrin of those that would love it to be the opposite case. Do you see it that way? Is this going to re-energize his 2024 case? Well, in the short term, yes. Um, something can only be new once, correct? You know, yes. Trump was new in 2016. He ran for election in 2020, ran for re-election in 2020. Um, fast forward, he loses the election. He runs, he's running again for 2024. Um, the, the, general election, uh, even if he wins the nomination, general election is still a year and a half away. So, you know, Trump's been on the political scene now going on at uh, seven and a half to eight years. And so it, that, that he's not new. The whole Make America Great Again movement is not new. So, yes, this will get his, his base uh, and fired up because, of course, they're offended. Any right-thinking American should be offended and should be concerned, even if you don't agree with Trump. And, you know, there's always the distinction between Trump's policies and Trump's personality and his character, all of which we as Catholics especially can, can criticize legitimately. But we're talking not just about a man or a politician. We're talking about the operation of our government. We're talking about the political institutions that make our country a stable society with a fair, orderly, stable government where we are ruled by law and not by men. So to distort the political system and the, and the uh, criminal justice system, which is part of the overall political and governmental system, to distort that for political purposes and go after your political opponents um, is new, and it's going to make the people who are the targets uh, fired up. Now, um, there's a lot of talk in the media about how this is going to help his campaign, and yet you're right. I, I think it's going to help him, and what I mean is, in the short term is it'll probably help him in the primary his, his political followers are going to rally behind him um those that perhaps were lukewarm are going to be warmer those that are warm are going to be hot um in the long term though you win an election uh by doing two things one you, you get your base to support you and, and to turn out and vote and two you persuade enough of the people in the middle to come over to your side, the independents and the swing voters. The other side has their base also, and you're just generally never going to get those. Go back and look at American presidential election results. Look at uh, most uh, U.S. Senate races, even in states that are solidly one side or the other. It's very rare for a candidate to get more than about 53 or 54 or 55 percent of the vote. If you if you get if a candidate gets 54 percent of the vote at the presidential level, that is a landslide in this country, mm. especially with the electoral college. But even at the senatorial level, if a candidate can can regularly get 55 plus percent of the vote, they're in a pretty comfortable situation. Politicians in America today, in national offices, especially for president. And in many of the swing states, for governor and for senator, remember congressional districts are smaller and they're more they're gerrymandered. But um, that small group in the middle, you have to ask: Are they going to be put off by the Trump indictment, or are they going to be alarmed by that politicization of the criminal justice system the way some of us are? Uh, my own judgment is that, by and large, to a lot of people, uh, this is going to be some indication that, you know, where there's smoke, there's fire, or it's just more drama that they don't want. Um, even if it's a bad case, most people don't want drama like that in their presidential candidates. And to that extent, it's not going to help President Trump. Hmm. And look, most people are not sitting around following the news as closely as you do, not just as a radio host, but as a concerned American, you know. Look at the number of people, for example, that watch the uh, evening news shows. Any network, CNN, Fox News, uh, MSNBC. You know, look at the number of people that watch those shows. You know, we're talking about 
less than a million or maybe yeah, maybe a million on a good night. There are over 300 million people in this country. Well, uh, you know, tens of millions there, over 300 million, uh, tens of millions are too young to vote. But of the adults in this country, most are not sitting there watching the political news all the time and following this blow by blow. They're going to catch the headlines. They're going to catch the mainstream media's presentation of this, which is not the same as your presentation. And that's not necessarily going to help uh, President Trump in his reelection campaign. It's probably going to hurt. Well, uh, former Attorney General Bill Barr said, I hope they don't put Trump on the stand because he can't control this himself. <laughs> and he's probably getting himself in a lot more trouble. So we're about to find out history in the making right before our eyes. A former president of the United States being uh, arraigned here. Very interesting to say the least. Uh, Brent Haynes, God love you. Thank you for your time and your insight onto this. We'll have to have you back for some follow-up. But coming up after the break, more breaking news and stories. And then we're going to talk about a sore subject, vasectomies, and why Catholic men should consider reversing them. All of that and more coming up on A Catholic Take. It's coming up next. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean. So good to be on with you. And here are your headline news. Hot Air reports Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg brings attempted murder charges against a man who shot a thief who first shot him. A Manhattan parking garage attendant who was shot twice while confronting an alleged thief then wrestled the gun away and opened fire on the suspect. He has been charged with attempted murder, police and sources say. The overnight worker identified by cops as Musa Diara, 57-year-old, who was also hit with assault and criminal possession of a weapon charge in the Saturday incident, which unfolded around 5.30 in the morning as the attendant saw a man peering into cars on the second floor of the West 31st Street garage, the sources say. Believing the man was stealing, the attendant brought him outside and asked what was inside his bag. Instead of complying, the suspect, identified as Charles Rohde, 59-year-old, pulled a gun from the bag and shot the area twice, once in the stomach with the second shot grazing his head. Despite his injuries, the area wrestled the gun away from Rohde and shot him in return. Rohde was also charged with attempted murder, assault, and criminal possession of a weapon, as well as burglary charges, according to police late Saturday night. The New York Post reports more than 500,000 flee California since 2020. The exodus of roughly 508,000 residents between April 2020 and July 2022 was spurred by high housing prices to frequent natural disasters like wildfires, mudslides and high crime rates in the cities. The Daily Mail reported Saturday the largest population declines were in San Francisco County at 7.1 percent and Lassen County at 7.5 some areas of the state have been have seen population growth, however. 19 of California's 58 counties saw an increase in the number of residents during the same time period, mainly inland counties with lower housing costs. Interesting, they never mentioned the pandemic and all of the uh, draconian lockdowns there. Hmm, wonder why. Daily Wire reports, former Google CEO warns about impact of AI on politics calls on regulators and tech industry to rein it in. Former Google CEO Eric Schmidt said that the artificial intelligence could hurt American politics and needs to be reined in. Schmidt said that, quote, while AI has amazing potential to do good for society, it first needs to overcome the present challenges. He warned that authorities need to help regulate the technology right now. Everyone is focused on bias, which is certainly a problem and is being worked on. But The real problem is that when these systems are used to manipulate people's day-to-day lives, literally the way they think, what they choose, and so forth, it affects how democracies work, close quote. Earlier this week, leaders in the tech industry, including Tesla and Twitter CEO Elon Musk and Apple co-founder Steve Wozniak, called for pausing the development of new AI models past the current generation. Yahoo reports Russia blames Ukraine for bomb that killed military blogger. Russian officials said Vladlin Tatarsky, 40 years old, was killed Sunday as he was leading a discussion at a cafe on the banks of the Neva River in the historic heart of St. Petersburg. Over 30 people were wounded by the blast and 10 of them remain in grave condition, according to authorities. 
The National Anti-Terrorist Committee, a uh, state structure that coordinates counterterrorism, said that the attack on Tatarsky was planned by Ukrainian special services with the involvement of people who have cooperated with an anti-corruption foundation created by jailed Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny. And those are your headline news. Remember, every story we discuss, even with our guests, are going to be linked in our show notes, which you can find linked up at thestationofthecross.com forward slash ACT. That's thestationofthecross.com forward slash ACT. But I just saw uh, an interview last week on the YouTube channel, What Laura Likes. And you can find that on YouTube, What Laura Likes on YouTube. Uh, is a conversation between a husband and a wife on why he chose to get the vasectomy and why he chose to get it reversed. And you and I both know there are lots of Catholic men who've had vasectomies. And I think this conversation could impact them and their decision making. So I've invited Ryan Joseph to be on our program today to talk about that. Good morning to you, Ryan Joseph. Hey, good morning, Joe. Thanks for having me. Uh, It's pretty cool to (laughs) be invited on. Glory be to God. Well, I am grateful that you uh, were able to join us today. Praise be to God. And uh, well, by the way, welcome to Holy Week. Um, I can't believe it's already Holy Week. My mind is blown how fast uh, Lent flew by this time. But nonetheless, let's talk about vasectomies. There is a lot of Catholic men who have gotten vasectomies. And I think a lot of men have regretted that decision. And some of those men have had it reversed, but I think many haven't. So let's start with why. Why did you decide to get your vasectomy and were you married at the time that you did that yeah we were married at the time when i did that it was actually after our second child and um now yes i was baptized and confirmed catholic poorly catechized one at the time um the decision i and i and i say in the interview with my wife that it was purely a selfish decision and that, that that's mostly true um you know, uh, we grow up in this world um, where we have a really warped version of sex, our relationship with sex, and um, I kind of co- I call it the you know the, the the porn generation, which starts in my mind from the sexual revolution in the 1960s and on, where we we got this really warped version of what sex is. And so, for me, getting the vasectomy was all right. I've had two now. I'm done. Now it's me time, and I didn't. I did not understand what, how, what the church's stance was on the um, on, on vasectomies, on, on contraceptive, and even theology of the body. You know about sex at the time, and so. But it, it, it hurt my wife. It broke her. Like she, uh, in, in the interview, she's she didn't really know either. But she started looking in right before I went in for surgery to have it done, and. She was all of a sudden just all just regretting it, but she couldn't stop me at the time. I was like, my mind is made up. I'm doing it because I wanted to. I wanted to indulge in the uh, in in that carnal pleasure, which is that that really uh, in inverted relationship we have with sex in our culture nowadays. Um, and I was completely wrong to do it. I had no idea. At the how time. much how much peer pressure. Were you having to get a vasectomy? It seems like for a lot of men, they'll they'll be in peer groups, they'll be among coworkers or friends, you know, who who have also had vasectomies, also th- or, or they're contracepting in some way. They're thinking very selfishly about the the act of intimacy between a man and his wife, and they feel pressured to kind of be a part of that herd. How much were you feeling in that regard? Yeah, I wouldn't call it, say, peer pressure. Well, hell, maybe a little bit like, hey, come on, man, you, you know, go ahead and do it. It's just a little noodle that they, you know, snip and, and tie in a knot, you know, kind of making a joke about it like it's not such a big deal. Um, but in my line of work, in the, now I, I'm in the military, and so the culture in the military in regards to subject matter of, you know, sex and sexual relations um, – it's not virtuous, you know, <laughs> to say I the do least. know, yes, yeah. And there's a lot of, yeah, yeah, I know you know. <laughs> so um, there, is a, there is a lot, there's a lot of guys in the military, and they are encouraged to get vasectomies um, by their peers. Um, not so much directly all the time, but sometimes it's indirect. Um, and uh, so you start to become a part of that culture, 
you want to be a part and, and you don't want to separate yourself from that culture. You don't want to separate yourself from, um, being the guys and running with the front of the pack, you know? And mm. so when you start considering it and, other, and the other guys are kind of like, yeah, man, do it. It's great. And then you don't have to worry. You don't have to worry about kids running around when you're 50. You don't have to worry about this or that. Yada, yada. And so it does get to you a bit when you're in that culture. Um, I did have somebody who was actually my supervisor at the time, and he, he did talk, talk me into it a bit. Um, oh, wow. And he made it sound like it was a very attractive thing to do. Um, and he made it sound so easy and, and painless. And so, yeah, I went for it. I went for it. And um, it was one of the biggest regrets that I ever had. Yeah. Now, what, what was the, what was your relationship with your spouse like right after the vasectomy? You said that your wife was uh, already before the the operation was feeling like uh, this shouldn't happen. What do we do here? What is the? She was looking into what the church taught about that. Uh, is I think is what you said. And so it seems like emotionally yeah. she was already look, heading towards uh, sort of a train wreck there. So what was that relationship like post surgery? How did that affect your, your just getting along? How did it affect your home? How did it affect your intimacy? Well, when she first had brought up, I was kind of the attitude like, la, 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 I'm not listening. Um, and uh, I don't think she really brought it up again for quite some time. Maybe a couple years went by and she'd bring it up every now and then. She'd be very sorrowful. She'd be in tears and be asking her, you know, what's the problem? Uh, and she would tell me, like, you know, there's a piece of me that has been cut out because of what we did. We shouldn't have mm. done it. And for the longest time, I was very resist. I would, that's ridiculous. I'm not listening to this because, you know, and this, this was back, you know, uh, this claim, I was still very poorly catechized. I'm still a baby Catholic growing up, you know, and, um, because I, I didn't become Catholic until 2007. Um, and uh, she kept bringing it up. And when she would tell me that, my, you know, inside I was hurting too. But I didn't want to show it. Because, you know, us guys, we don't, you know, it's supposed to be a manly thing to just, you right. know, have sex whenever we want without consequences and not feel any emotion, not feel any pain. But inside I really was dying, but I didn't really want to admit it. I didn't want to admit to her. It took quite some time. And as far as how our relationship was, it was back and forth with that quite often. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't notice that our int intimacy had changed. I had no idea. It was kind of like this um, slow boiling, you know, thing where you don't really notice how hot the water's getting until it's too late. It wasn't until after I had it reversed, I realized how much our intimacy had changed because of what wow. I had done. Um, and that, you know, it's really all because you cut yourself off from what God designed for you, designed for all of us. And it, when we become one flesh as like husband and wife, that's the way God needs it. And I mean, that's the way God wants it to be. That's the way he designed it. So if you were to say... Put two hoses together. It's one hose, right? No, not necessarily. If you have one end kinked off, the whole purpose of having those together is not working anymore. That's the best analogy I come up with. But um, <laughs> it was, uh, yeah, it was. Uh, our did did you our see, intimacy uh, relationship what, was a little fractured, but it took me a while to really notice. Yeah. Now we're we have, we're up against a break here, so I want to get one more question before the break, and that is: Did you see any difference or relationship change with you and your children? because of the vasectomy. Was there any change there? Oh, actually, yeah, that's a good question. Um, there was. Um, both my kids have been dying for another baby brother or sister. And so when we announced to them what I had done, and then this is why we can't have children, and now I'm the dad's going to go fix it, both my daughter and my son were just – jumping through the air. They were so excited. I couldn't believe it. I didn't know that they cared that much, but they did. I had no idea that kids were that in tune with the future of a family household like that. Yeah, I can imagine. 
Well, uh, all right. So let's pause there because we, we are at a break. There's about 300 some odd people listening on the ICR app for the Sporting Plus. Everybody on our live video feeds and all of our radio stations. Good morning to everybody. Thanks for being a part of the show. If you know a guy in this category, someone who's out of a sectomy, you might encourage them to tune in. Coming up after this quick break, I'm going to ask Brian Joseph, well, what caused him to want and desire to go through the effort and the difficulty, let alone the pain, of having it reversed? I think it's an important part of the conversation. It's coming up after the break, so don't go anywhere. More of a Catholic take is coming up right after this break. Also, do not forget, we are in the middle of our spring appeal. We are brought to you by you. You make it possible for us to share the good, the true, and the beautiful. Clarity with charity in a world that wants nothing but noise. You make that possible. Make your gift of support right now. Go to thestationofthecross.com. Click on that donate button in the top left corner, or the right corner, rather. Stationofthecross.com. We'll be right back. Don't go anywhere. The Station of the Cross began broadcasting in Buffalo, New York in 1999. Since then, our listening areas have multiplied and expanded into several states. While our mission is to grow the Catholic faith through radio and other media outlets, our apostolate is supportive of but independent from your local diocese. Through your generosity, we are able to inspire countless listeners with the gospel and help lead them to a parish to be spiritually nourished by the sacraments. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McClain. So good to be on with you. Praise be to God. Coming up at the top of the hour, Holy Mass will air. And if you're going to uh, tune into that, please do keep us in your prayers. I'd be very grateful for you. Uh, but uh, we'll stay on the live video feed for another half hour to interact directly with you, your commentary. You get to drive the conversation. And I got to tell you, I got invited to the premiere of Nefarious and I'm looking forward to doing that. I'll be telling you about the details of that coming up in the after show. Plus, I want to know, how is your Lent gone? All of that in the after show today. But joining us right now is Ryan Joseph. He His wife has a YouTube channel called What Laura Likes. We're going to be putting a link to it in our show notes, the station of the cross dot com forward slash ACT. But I saw a video of Ryan and his wife having a conversation about why he got the vasectomy and why he chose to have it reversed powerful conversation a sore subject because we all know too many catholic men who have had vasectomies and some of them haven't yet contemplated whether or not they should have them reversed or can they have them reversed so i thought this would be a great conversation to have ryan joseph welcome back to the show so tell me what exactly set you on the course to even considering the reversal when probably most men don't it was um short and simple answer is committing myself to the teachings of the Catholic Church and um, to not robbing God of another Catholic in this world, you know, of having another amen. Catholic, another servant for him in this world. So yeah, uh, when it comes down to the nitty gritty of it, I had to be honest with myself. You know, I had to talk myself up. I call it, I had to big Sarge talk myself up, you know, Stop being a scared. Stop being afraid. There, the the whole the nation, the whole world has been built b- before we had all this technology and all this, you know, uh, medical science to do what we do nowadays. The men built this world without worrying about the, uh, how many kids you have. They had children. My my great grandfather had tons of children, and he never was scared about it. Why am I being such a little baby about it? That's what I had to tell myself. Now you said you were you were you became Catholic in two thousand seven. Where did you where were you before that? What were you before that? I was a wandering degenerate. Uh, <laughs> Amen, brother. Uh, I, yeah. um, you know, uh, I met my wife when I was in high school, and um, and uh, I, I spent. And that was another instant of me being a coward. It, it took me about six years to build up the courage to actually uh, get married. And, um, of course, I had to be Catholic in order to get married with, to her. Um, <laughs> and we'd already been going to church together, and I, at the time, just kind of was like, all right, I'm, I'm okay with this. And so I did. And, um, you know, hearing the marriage vow and going through baptism and all, all, all the sacraments, it, 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 
a big difference. So, yeah, amen. You, get a little you know, pornography, that pornography kind of emasculates <laughs> men. Pornography emasculates men, and uh, and I think a lot of people who haven't either suffered with pornography or women in general can't really understand the effect of of this type of thing, contraception and pornography, what it does to a man's psyche, what it does to a man's emotions. And it is a big issue. And when you become free of those issues, you're, you're having to make up for a lot of lost ground, especially like myself. I was raised to pornography, so I was addicted to it for many years before yeah. I, I, I was freed of it. And, uh, and I think it's a really difficult thing to then interact with your spouse in a healthy way, in a natural and normal way, which is something you alluded to in the last segment, that your intimacy level went on to a, it went to a whole nother level between you and your spouse. Can you touch on that again? Yeah, um, I brought that up. I actually have a, a video about this on my own channel um, where I talk about our relationship with porn, men and porn. And um, it certainly does play a role in this decision to sterilize ourselves um, because we get from a very early age, you know, we're inducted with a lot of sexuality and if you're unfortunate like me you see porno you've been introduced to pornography by the time you're seven years old and it warps your mind and the devil gets his hooks in you and he pulls you in a direction that's far away from the guiding light of christ and um it can um it it, it takes you to this place where you're you're thinking about intimacy as a pleasure, a carnal pleasure, like an animal. You want it, you have it. Nothing in between. Now, of course, our my, me and my wife, our, our intimacy has fluctuated because of the vasectomy and because of things like pornography, you know, in my life. But it, there has always been a meaningful bond. It's just it wasn't until you I actually just severed. Um, that 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 uh, that um, that tie that or not the tie but those hooks that the devil had in me with vasectomy and with the viewing of pornography and acting upon pornography that you realize what it is that you have cut yourself off from and you have cut yourself off from you know the Holy Spirit you've cut yourself off from the fullness of becoming one with your spouse is yeah. That, Explain yeah, it well, I kind of now, ramble on sometimes, man. No, no, no. It's, I'm glad you mentioned you had a channel, and it's uh, Reclaiming the Sword. We're going to put a link to that in the show notes as well today. Uh, Reclaiming the Sword on YouTube channel. You should check that out. We'll put a link to that specific video, Spiritual Motivation for Purity, Men, and Porn. Uh, the uh, the station across dot com forward slash forward slash act is where we put all of our show notes. But uh, all right, so let's talk about getting it reversed. So you you made that decision. It obviously has had great uh, effect on your your marriage and your life. Praise be to God. Your relationship with your kids. Praise be to God. What for a lot of men, the cost of reversing a vasectomy is probably too high. Now you said you served in the military. Did the military cover that procedure for you? Absolutely not. Um... And uh, disclaimer, uh, I share this opinion as my own opinion and not that of the U.S. military. So <laughs> the, the military does not encourage you to get it put back together. They only encourage you to get it snipped. Uh, they will not pay for it to get put back together. They make that very wow. clear. Um, yeah, uh, I mean <laughs> – I'll say more, but I'll probably get myself in trouble. I'm still active duty. So uh, <laughs> um, so you endured the cost of this. As far as and, the cost. Go ahead. Yeah, I endured the cost. We found a doctor in Oklahoma, uh, which worked out pretty good because we, I was actually stationed in Oklahoma at the time. And uh, his name is Dr. David Wilson of the Reversal Clinic. And, and it was a little less than two grand. And Wow. This is exactly what he does for his job. He's uh he's an evangelical. Um so he's he's doing in in God's name and uh he is doing this because he knows there's a lot of men out there who need to get right with God. Amen. And so uh, uh he's got he's got stories of people that come all the way from Africa uh, uh you know to get this done. I, I Africa maybe South Africa. <laughs> I don't think it, 
you know, but because uh, I don't think Africa is usually the type of place where you find this kind of uh, modernist uh, uh, practice of sex. Exactly. But, yeah. Would you be willing to send me a link to his practice so that I can include those in the show notes as well? I'm sure there's a lot of Catholic men that might be very interested in, in pursuing that. Uh, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, unfortunately, we're out of time, but uh, Ryan Joseph, I applaud you for your courage. We have to speak boldly in these difficult and dark times. And uh, and there are too many men who have had this happen. They've done this. They've made this decision. They've regretted it later. And maybe, maybe, who knows? They might be motivated to consider this reversal now, thanks to your testimony. So God bless you, Ryan Joseph. We really appreciate your time. And thank you for your service to our country, by the way. All right. Praise be to God. We are very grateful that you have all joined us today on the show. Do us a favor, share us with a friend. We'd be super appreciative. Coming up, though, it is uh, Holy Week. Tomorrow, I'm going to be making a journey for the for the big trip to the premiere of Nefarious. Alexander Trugowell from the Boniface Institute is going to be on. Attacks on the church, truth, goodness, all of that coming up on the program. Join us if you can.